Good morning, everyone. God bless you on this Sunday morning. On behalf of the New Beginning Church of God Sunday School Department, our pastor, Bishop Leroy Odom, our First Lady Evangelist, Willa Odom, and our Sunday School Superintendent, Missionary Sabrina Morgan, we are glad that you decided to join us for another Sunday School lesson. We are in our summer quarter of the Union Gospel Series lessons, and our main theme of study is people of valor. That is, people exhibiting great courage in the face of danger, especially in battle. Our study today is found under Unit 2, Courage Facing Threats. And we are at Lesson 5, entitled, Abijah Challenges King Jeroboam. The lesson is based in the book of 2 Chronicles, the 13th chapter, in verses 3 through 18. Let us start at this point with a question. Have you ever tried to take a stand for God only to realize you were outnumbered by a significant number of people? Standing up for righteousness is sure to leave you unpopular with many of your peers. Many places, including universities, corporate offices, government agencies, and ordinary work sites, abound with people who do not believe in Christ and are hostile to people who do. The important thing to remember is that if you stand with the Lord, he will stand with you. So today we want to talk about standing for God. None of us are strong enough to stand for the Lord in our own strength. We must rely on him to help us. Even then, God never promised life would be easy for the Christian this side of heaven. He did, however, assure us that he has already overcome the world that is hostile to us. We are not to be rude or obnoxious, but we should not hesitate to stand up for Jesus whenever the opportunity presents itself. So we want to learn that we must stand for God, stand amidst adversity. And we're going to look at a story today as the backdrop to help us to understand that with God on our side, we are able to stand. The aim to discuss that God is omnipresent and omnipotent, and we are always in a safe place when we stand with him. So when we say God is omnipresent, he is everywhere. And omnipotent, he is all-powerful. The life application to stress that it is vital that we trust the Lord to stand with us when we stand against the evil in our world. So we can rest assured that when we stand against the evil in this world, if we trust in the Lord, we are going to be in a safe place and we are going to be able to prevail because God is omnipresent. He is everywhere and he's omnipotent. He is all powerful. So we are in a safe place when we stand with him. And we want to look today at the story of Abijah challenges King Jeroboam. And we want to look at that story as our look into the life or journey of one who stands and trusts in God during the stance. The events of this lesson are estimated to have taken place around 913 to 911 BC. So about 913 years before the birth of Christ. And this is during the time of the divided monarchy. So the children of Israel are divided into the southern kingdom and northern kingdom. Southern kingdom having two tribes, northern kingdom having about 10 tribes. And they are, this is during the divided monarchy period, during their split. As we always discuss, the biblical events of scripture take place mainly in three continents, which are Europe, Asia, and Africa. Today, our focus is on the continent of Asia. 
And we are looking at the place of Ephraim. So when we talk about the tribes of Israel and how they were divided, the tribes had certain pieces of land that were allocated to them. And then the children of Israel became divided. So you have a divided monarchy. And as we stated earlier, two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, composed the southern kingdom and the other tribes composed the northern kingdom. So you, we're going to discuss two separate leaders. And you see here in red, Ephraim is a central point of today's lesson, and that's circled in red. After Solomon's reign, his kingdom split into two nations. Judah was comprised of two Israelite tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and was quite small compared to the ten tribes to the north that made up the kingdom of Israel. Remember, the children of Israel started out under a monarchy system with uh, Saul. And then from Saul, they had David and then Solomon. And this is where we pick up. It says, after Solomon's reign, his kingdom split into two nations. And the next king is going to be Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And Rehoboam is going to govern Judah and Benjamin. But then uh, Jeroboam is on the rise. Those nations were constantly at war with each other during the reigns of their first kings, Jeroboam, Israel, and Rehoboam, Judah. So Jeroboam became the king of the northern kingdom, and the northern kingdom is known as Israel. And Rehoboam, the southern kingdom, which also known as Judah. After the death of Rehoboam, his son Abijah was left to deal with the conflict with Jeroboam, and he turned to the Lord for help. So just to go through this history a little bit, uh, when Solomon passed and Rehoboam uh, became king, Jeroboam, which was a servant of Solomon, uh, rose up and people joined him and they disputed Rehoboam, and those in that composed the northern kingdom, they indicated, those people, how are you going to rule Rehoboam? Are you going to be exactly like Solomon? We think he was kind of harsh. And Rehoboam actually, before answering, sought counsel with uh, elders. But there were elders and there were a younger sect of people. And the elders indicated to Rehoboam that you should answer the, answer the people and indicate that you're not going to be uh, so harsh, but you're going to seek to uh, be peaceful. But the younger group said, no, let them know that you're going to, you know, rule with just a firm hand and even firmer, even harsh. So that didn't sit well with individuals. And so there was a faction that joined uh, Jeroboam, which became the northern kingdom. And Jeroboam became uh, their ruler, and Rehoboam was left with Judah, known as the southern kingdom. So after the death of Rehoboam, his son Abijah was left to deal with the conflict with Jeroboam. So Jeroboam was still alive and ruling the northern kingdom, and Abijah took over for Rehoboam, so he's still dealing with that conflict that existed between his father, Rehoboam, and Jeroboam. Now, understand Jeroboam also um, moved away from what God had wanted. So he got rid of uh, priests because uh, it was a Levite, Levitical tribe, the Levites, that God had indicated or mandated would be the priests, but Jeroboam dismantled that in the northern kingdom and started making people priests that weren't necessary of the Levitical tribe. And he started instituting uh, idol worship. So he, they moved away from what God had mandated and wanted. And I'm not to say that uh, Rehoboam or Abijah always did everything right, but with the southern kingdom, Abijah was still at this point in time uh, abiding by what God had wanted. So there, there goes the conflict between the two of them. And understand that the northern kingdom, because it has more tribes, is going to 
be uh, militarily more powerful because they have more people than the southern kingdom. So here you have Abijah now turns to the Lord for help in this conflict. We pick up with the scriptures, Second Chronicles, 13th chapter, the first through the third verse. In your readings, you may have started at the third verse, but let's read one through three right now. Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam began Abijah to reign over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Micaiah, the daughter of Uriel of Gibeah. And there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. And Abijah set the battle in array with an army of valiant men of war, even 400,000 chosen men. Jeroboam also set the battle in array against him with 800,000 chosen men, being mighty men of valor. So here in this verse, these few verses, you see it's the 18th year of King Jeroboam. So it's his 18th year of reign. And that's when Abijah began to reign over Judah. So he reigned uh, three years in Jerusalem. So understand Jerusalem is a part of the southern kingdom because of its location. And we go through a history of what Abijah's uh, mother was named. But important part here also is that there's war between Abijah and Jeroboam. So you understand the southern and northern kingdom are still at it. Abijah sets the battle, gets ready with an army of valiant men of war. So men who can fight. It says even 400,000 chosen men. Jeroboam in the northern kingdom has 800,000 men. Verses 4 through 7, And Abijah stood up upon Mount Zemarim, which is in Mount Ephraim, and said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam, and all Israel. Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt? Yet Jeroboam the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, is risen up and hath rebelled against his Lord. And there are gathered unto him vain men, the children of Belial, and have strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and tender-hearted and could not withstand them. So here Abijah is talking, giving the history of, of where we are. So we would look at Jeroboam is clearly not the chosen one because God had the children of Israel together and it was David's line that was to last and, and the house expanded. So Abijah starts out, ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel, he gave this kingdom over, over Israel to David forever. And don't get confused when we say kingdom over Israel when we talk about Israel and the children of Israel, we think about all the tribes. But for purposes of understanding um, this lesson and when you continue to read, the northern kingdom is given the name Israel. The southern kingdom is given the name Judah. But we're still talking about the children of Israel. It's just that those names are given to the tribes as they're split up, the, the regions or kingdoms as they're split up. It goes through talking about how Jeroboam, he was a servant of Solomon, and how he rose up, rebelled against the Lord, and gathered unto him uh, vain men, men not with God, and strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the, the son of Solomon, at a time where Rehoboam could not withstand them. Sometime after Abijah began to reign over Judah, he was confronted by a massive army under King Jeroboam of Israel. When Abijah, also known as Abijam in 1 Kings 15, mustered his troops in anticipation of battle, he soon discovered that his army was outnumbered two to one. Here's where we begin to get into the heart of this lesson when we start talking about taking a stand. So here you have Abijah, he's mustering his troops together because of this conflict, but he only has 400,000. 
And Jeroboam, who's in the disobedient mode, he has 800,000 troops. Because remember, the northern kingdom has more tribes than the southern kingdom. So it would stand to reason that their army is greater, more troops. This imbalance of the troops did not discourage Abijah, however. He stood at Mount Zemarim in Ephraim, which was located in Israel, and called out to Jeroboam and his army. He reminded them that God had given the kingdom of Israel to David and his descendants by a covenant that could not be broken. So remember, we read in the verse how Abijah stood and he began to speak what God had ordained. And so he wasn't uh, afraid to do it. In the northern kingdom, as 800,000 troops and Abijah was 400,000, he still stood up. He stood up on Mount Zemarine and Ephraim. And he called out to Jeroboam and his army reminded them that God had given the kingdom of Israel to David and his descendants by a covenant which could not be broken. Jeroboam, who had been a servant of David's son Solomon, rebelled against the house of David and led a revolt that resulted in the division of the nation, which is a history we talked about. Thus, Jeroboam was an illegitimate king. So we just want to stress to you again that it wasn't um, set out that the, the kingdom for the kingdom to be split, but it was promised to the house of David. So that's why the, the author here in the writing indicates that Jeroboam is considered an illegitimate king. Our practical point, number one, those who stand with the Lord can make God's appeal to their enemies with boldness and compassion. So if you know you are on the right side, you are following the word of God, you are in line with what God has indicated in his word and you are following his way, then you can make the appeal. It says those who stand with the Lord can make God's appeal to their enemies with boldness and compassion. You can speak to the enemy. You can speak with boldness and compassion because you know that God is with you. A practical point number two, those who rebel against God's standards cannot expect his blessing. That, that's important to understand. Let me just reiterate that again. Those who rebel go against God's standards, God's way, God's word, cannot expect his blessing. So don't and be in anticipation of God blessing when you know you are rebelling against God when you know you are acting contrary to God's way. So when we talk about taking a stand, you're not going to be so secured in taking a stand if you know you're not following the way of God. The way you're going to take a stand against evil in this day and time and stand on righteousness, if you know you are doing God's will, then you, you're assured that God is with you. Second Chronicles, the 13th chapter, the 8th through the 10th verse, as we continue in this story with Abijah and Jeroboam. Abijah continues on, and now ye think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of the sons of David, and ye be a great multitude, and there are with you golden calves, which Jeroboam made you for gods. Have ye not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and have made you priests after the manner of the nations of other lands? So that whosoever cometh to consecrate himself with a young bullock and seven rams, the same may be a priest of them that are no gods. But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. And the priests which minister unto the Lord are the sons of Aaron, and the Levites wait upon their business. This is Abijah just testifying and saying how they are standing on what God has ordained and what God has wanted. So, you know, now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord. You think to withstand this uh, kingdom of God, it says, in the hands of the sons of David. Ye be a great multitude, you may have 800,000, 
and you're with the golden calves. We know you you went off to do your idol worship, idol worshiping uh, other gods and not the true God. It says, have ye not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites? You started making other priests. You got rid of what God had ordained who the priest should be, and you started making other priests. And it says, so that whosoever cometh to consecrate himself with a young bullock and seven rams, the same may be a priest. You started using your own criteria to make priests. But as for us, the Lord is our God. You want to be able to say, that I'm standing with God. As for me, and some say me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You want to be standing on the principles of God. Verses 11 through 12, And they burn unto the Lord every morning and every evening burnt sacrifices and sweet incense. The showbread also set they in order upon the pure table and the candlestick of gold with the lamps thereof, to burn every evening. For we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but ye have forsaken him. And behold, God himself is with us for our captain, and his priests with sounding trumpets to cry alarm against you. O children of Israel, fight ye not against the Lord God of your fathers, for ye shall not prosper. So Abijah continues on and talks about how they are following the ways of God, um, the things that God has set up for them to do, how he wants them to sacrifice, how he wants them to uh, handle with the, the showbread and what he wants them to do uh, individually like with the candlesticks and the, the regiments that God has set up, they are continuing and they are doing. But he's saying, you all have forsaken God. God is our captain. And... He goes on to talk about uh, the priests and sounding the trumpets to cry alarm against them, against Jeroboam. And he says that if you continue and you want to fight against us, you are fighting against the Lord, God of your fathers, and you're not going to prosper. What bold statements. But you can make bold statements if you're standing on the word of God and you're following what God has for you to do. To get into these verses uh, a little further with the author here, Abijah confronted Jeroboam concerning his reliance upon his military superiority over Judah. Being a much larger kingdom, it stands to reason that his army would also be larger. According to Abijah, however, this was all that Jeroboam had going for him in this fight against Judah, and that simply was not enough. Uh, you may look like you have a stronger military, you have more people, but hey, that's not going to be enough because I have my God on my side. Jeroboam's ultimate downfall was that he had abandoned God and established his own form of idolatry and led Israel against the Lord. He had made two golden calves run off the true priests of the Lord and sanctified his own priests from foreign lands. You can try to do something and make it seem like it's the right thing or, you know, include what you may deem your religiosity into it, but you have to follow what is right. So here, Jeroboam knew what was right. The people knew what was right, what God had mandated for them to do. They decided to deviate. And it says his ultimate downfall was that he abandoned God, established his own form of idolatry. You can't abandon God and establish your own form of what you're going to do. If you've been taught the right thing to do and you know what is right to do, don't go off and start, you know, doing your own thing and, and worshiping idols, but trust in God. You know, he started making his own priest, running off the, the true priest and making his own priest, his own rules. Stand for God. Jeroboam ordained as a priest anyone who brought the right price. He completely disregarded what the Mosaic law had required for priests and proper worship. Abijah not only mocked Jeroboam for his rejection of God and reliance upon himself, 
but he also publicly stated his belief that God was with Judah. Judah still had Levitical priests who were dedicated to serving according to the law. They trusted God to care for them, but Jeroboam and Israel had rejected him. Because of this, Abijah was confident God would be with them in battle and give victory to Judah in spite of Israel's numerical superiority. Finally, he warned Jeroboam not to fight against Judah, because to do so would be to fight against God. Don't go in that direction. God is for me. You don't want to do the wrong, because God is for me. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Stand on righteousness. Be humble, but stand on righteousness. Don't run scared. Stand on righteousness. Stand firm-footed and talk for God, meaning testify of how God is able and how good God is. And don't run and hide, but fight the evil with good. And be humble. Practical point number three. Military might is no substitute for moral integrity and obedience to God. People may look like they have a lot, may look like they can consume you and be overbearing, but that type of might, that military might, or even what someone else may have that looks like it's more than what you have. If you have moral integrity and are being obedient to God, then you can stand and know that God is going to be with you. Practical point number four, God's people must conduct God's work by his standards, not by their own and not by the world's. So you can't create God's standards for him. God has set forth what his standards are. Read the word of God and know what God wants. So you cannot start creating your own standards or allow the world to create the standards for God. God's standards are in his word. Abide by the word of God. Second Chronicles, the 13th chapter, the last verses, 13 through 18. But Jeroboam caused an ambushment to come about behind them. So they were before Judah, and the ambushment was behind them. And when Judah looked back, behold, the battle was before and behind. And they cried unto the Lord, and the priests sounded with the trumpets. Then the men of Judah gave a shout. And as the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. And the children of Israel fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their hand. And Abijah and his people slew them with a great slaughter. So there fell down slain of Israel five hundred thousand chosen men, Thus the children of Israel were brought under at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed, because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. So Jeroboam had troops in front and behind. They ambushed Abijah and Judah. And when uh, Abijah and Judah realized that they were encompassed about with troops, that they were in front behind, they cried out to the Lord, and the priests sounded the trumpets. So the, the priests was instrumental in calling upon God and in this whole process. So it, it lets us know how God is in the forefront. Prayer is in the forefront. Our, our worship and dedication to God. So it's not by worldly powers or your own power, but it's by the strength of God, the, the spirit of God that delivers us that helps us through our walk daily. Remember, have a prayer life. It says, Then the men of Judah gave a shout, and as the men of Judah shouted, came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. doesn't necessarily say how God did it and, it and overcame all those troops, but it says he did it. It says he did it, and they slew a great slaughter that day. While Abijah was speaking, Jeroboam was setting up an ambush for the Judean army. So we see this from the, the verses. He sent a battalion to attack Abijah's army from behind 
while others would attack from the front. By the time Judah's soldiers realized what was going on, the enemy had them surrounded. When they saw that the Israelite army had the upper hand, the Judean soldiers, meaning those troops of Judah, cried out to the Lord for help, and the priests blew their trumpets. The men of Judah then sounded the battle cry, and the Lord gave Abijah and Judah victory over Jeroboam and his might, mighty army. The outnumbered Judean army chased the defeated Israelites and killed half a million of their warriors. Israel was subdued by the Judeans, who won because of their faith in the Lord. Judah did not win because of their superior size or intelligence. They were smaller in number. In fact, the Israelites had them overmatched by every account. There really is no earthly reason why Judah prevailed over Israel. The key to our success, however, does not come from our pursuit of worldly greatness, but from our faith in the Lord. So when people talk about accomplishments, that's why it's important to stay humble in your talk of accomplishments, because it's not something that you just did on your own, but it's by the power of God. You have to give God the praise. God gave you the breath. God gave you the ingenuity. God bless the workings of your mind, even the dedication you may have put in, the hard work you may have put in to accomplish something. It was by the grace of God that you were able to do it. God blessing you even when you were down and you, there were times where he lifted you up. So you have to give God the praise in all that you do. So all of the successes that you have are by the grace of God and power through him. Practical point number five, we must trust God for victory no matter how difficult or even how easy the battle appears. Always give God the praise in all that you do. Know that God has blessed you so you don't have to look at yourself as so small and that you're insignificant, but in the eyes of God, you have to look at yourself as needing him. So don't make yourself bigger than God. So you can look at yourself and don't have a small self-esteem and know that you are blessed, but realize that all that you're doing is through the grace of God and that he's allowed you to be where you are. Practical point number six, faith and obedience are key to seeing God work in our lives. Faith, a belief, and obedience, doing his will are key to seeing God work in our lives. Have faith and trust in him. Do his will. Don't go in your own directions, but trust in God. Have faith, do his will. Put those two together, they are powerful. They are key to seeing God work in your life. For our reflection today, this was some lesson about Abijah and Jeroboam and Abijah trusting in God. Abijah stood against an army that was twice the size of his own, and yet he felt secure that he could defeat them. Why? Because he trusted the Lord, knowing God had blessed Judah and they were following him. If we will trust the Lord and follow him as well, we can be sure he will bless us and provide for us. We do not need to fear the Lord, the world, we do not need to fear the world, even if it appears we are outnumbered. We are never in the minority when God is with us. Our enemy Satan will employ all sorts of deceitful stratagems and attacks, all types of strategies, but they will prove ineffective if we keep our eyes of faith steadfastly on God and his power. Oh, we thank you today for joining us for another Sunday School session. Remember to stand. Stand on the Word of God. In, in this day and time, stand. Stand against evil. Stand for righteousness. Be humble in all that you do, always giving God the praise. Have a strong prayer life and give praise to God each and every day. Have courage and faith as you trust God daily. Pray for strength. He will bless you and provide for you. Until next time, 
Be blessed.